The FBI hopes this latest video will stir new leads in the murder of 18-year-old Samantha Koenig. Authorities say this surveillance video from Alaska shows Keyes abducting Koenig from her job at a coffee stand in Anchorage on February 1st. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. As normal, this is going to be a multi-part series, and videos will come out as soon as possible. If you could hit the like button and comment down below, that would be greatly appreciated as the engagement helps my content get distributed further. And of course, if you're new here, please subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you never miss an upload because I'm bad at keeping a schedule. Today, we'll be doing another serial killer deep dive, and this time we are discussing Israel Keys Part 1. Let's get into it. Didn't sleep much last night. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> These are good work, apparently. I had muscles sore this morning. I didn't even know I had it. Really? <laughs> Which muscles? Jeez, that's a good thing you didn't get a full on. This reminds me of like those uh, late night infomercials where you just sell those machines that shock your abs and stuff. Oh. It's like that. On you have one? You bought one of them? No, I can't believe that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I tried it once. It's really you get ripped from it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, so, uh, you weren't too taken with the uh, machine, basically? No, no, all the ab? Yeah, shocker things. You know, those things are like freaking fingernails on a chalkboard. Israel Keyes could be the most heinous serial killer in the United States. What we know about him is very limited, and until his arrest, he barely existed on paper. No one had any idea who Israel Keyes was. He was a killer that had no preferred victim type, no consistent method of attack. He had military training and knew how to evade detection from the police. He drove for miles and miles with potential victims in Canada, the U.S., and abroad. He drew inspiration from Ted Bundy and called Dennis Rader a wimp for expressing remorse for his victims. Many of his victims' bodies were never recovered, and he made the mistake of confessing to two. He allegedly went to Mexico to modify his body to be better at killing. Had it not been a few mistakes, he could have gone on for decades without being caught. Part 1. The Disappearance of Samantha Koenig February 2, 2012, in Anchorage, Alaska, a young barista opened up the Common Grounds coffee stand. When she arrived at work, she immediately noticed something wasn't right. The stand had been left unlocked, none of the closing duties had been done, and the cash register had been left open without any cash in it. She checked who had been in last and was surprised to learn it had been Samantha Koenig, an 18-year-old hire that had been a great employee so far. Samantha was still new, but she'd been working at the kiosk for less than a month and had always done thorough closes. She called her boss and told her about her concern. Her boss said that she would take care of it and open up the kiosk as usual. Her boss called Anchorage police and requested an officer to look into things. At that point, it had appeared that Samantha had made off with the previous day's cash and disappeared. The kiosk had a panic button inside, and it hadn't been pressed, and the kiosk didn't look like there were any signs of distress. Officers began an investigation, which initially wasn't taken very seriously. They interviewed her father, James Koenig, who had talked to Samantha the previous evening. She had asked him to bring her dinner. Then they spoke to Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne. 
He said that the couple had been fighting. He said that Samantha had accused him of cheating and told him that she was going to a friend's house to cool off. James had attempted to find Samantha that evening. She didn't have her truck with her. Her boyfriend had it. When her boyfriend had gone to pick Samantha up when her shift ended at around 8.30 p.m., he had noticed that the kiosk was dark and it appeared empty. He said that he got out and looked in the window and saw that Samantha wasn't there. The tone of the investigation began to shift when the owner of the kiosk gave officers surveillance footage from the night before. It showed Samantha at 8 o'clock, calm, chatting with a customer through the window and making a beverage. The footage didn't have audio and the customer was out of the camera's range. Something shifted when Samantha abruptly turned the lights off. That was when officers knew this wasn't a teenager that had gone off to blow off some steam. She had been kidnapped. An abduction seemed so absurd. The kiosk was next to a popular gym, as well as a well-traveled road. The abductor had been bold. He also hadn't seemed to be in a rush, having been at the kiosk for over 17 minutes. He had also been able to keep Samantha calm. She hadn't appeared scared until he began to lead her out of the building. Surveillance from a next-door building gave officers another angle. It showed a man forcing Samantha into a white Chevrolet pickup truck. From both cameras, officers could tell that the man was very tall. He wore a ski mask and a black jacket. Because Samantha had remained so calm, officers had been inclined to believe that she had known the abductor. He might have been someone she trusted, as she had seemingly left without so much as calling for help. Her father James hounded local police to investigate this as a kidnapping. James was a trucker by trade and was known to have a shady past. He raised Samantha as a single parent and he loved his daughter fiercely. He was not willing to let his missing daughter fall between the cracks of police bureaucracy. He arranged for a candlelit vigil, assembled a group of volunteers to put posters up, and he took donations and established a reward fund. He felt responsible. Had he brought Samantha dinner that night when she'd asked, he would have been at the kiosk at 11 p.m., he had been horrified to learn that he was one of the primary suspects, as well as her boyfriend, Dwayne. The only thing James could do was rile up the might of Alaska and keep the case in the public eye and to put pressure on officers to continue investigating. He helped to bring the case to national attention. Samantha was a senior in high school. She was kind and well-liked by her classmates. She was responsible, worked hard, and rose above them despite having troubles in life and was succeeding. She had wanted to work with animals or become a nurse. She was described as being someone who looked out for others, making sure they had enough and were included. Dwayne had seen something the night that Samantha had gone missing. He had received a text from her at 11.30 p.m. saying that she would be spending the night at a friend's house. Then he said something odd had happened. At 3 a.m. he felt a need to go outside to the front of the house where they parked their vehicles, and there was a man going through Samantha's truck. The men stood and looked at each other for a moment, and then the strange man walked away. 
He and James searched the vehicle and noticed the only thing missing was Samantha's driver's license that she kept in the top visor pocket. When asked why they hadn't called police, he said that he and James believed that the officers wouldn't file a missing person report for at least 24 hours after Samantha had disappeared. There was no physical evidence in the case. The crime scene had been contaminated when it wasn't contained initially. They had no indication that Samantha had left the state. There was no record of her on any ships, planes, or have crossed the border. By February 17th, Samantha had been missing for nearly three weeks when her father got a text message from her phone. The text said, Connor Park sign under the pick of Albert. Ain't she purdy? Officers suited up. They had no idea what they would find at the park. Connor Park was less than five miles from downtown Anchorage, and there pinned to a bulletin board was a Ziploc bag containing a photo of Samantha and a ransom note. The photograph was a sign of life. In the photo was Samantha with a man's hand holding a recent newspaper. The picture was shown to James, and the first thing he noticed was that Samantha's hair was braided, and she never styled her hair like that. Along with the photo was a ransom note. It had been typed on plain white paper and demanded $30,000. The note said that if the demand was met, Samantha would be released in six months. The note contained the numbers on Samantha's debit card and had instructions to deposit the money into the account. This gave officers and the FBI investigators a way to potentially capture the kidnapper if he used the debit card to take the money out. At the FBI's request, James deposited $5,000 from the reward money fund into the account. The FBI thought it would be best not to put the entire demand, hoping that it would frustrate the kidnapper and force him to reach out again. Four hours after the ransom money was deposited, someone tried to withdraw $600 from an ATM in Anchorage. Then the person began to go from ATM to ATM to withdraw the maximum daily amount, totaling more than $1,000 on the first night. It took several days for the images from the ATM machines to come back from FBI experts, and the experts determined that the man had an athletic frame. He was wearing a dark hoodie with white paint splattered on the front. Another key piece of information was that the expert believed that the suspect was likely a Marine based on a logo on one of his hoodies. Samantha had been missing for a month by the time the officers and the FBI had a vague description of the suspect and had been able to confirm that they were still in Anchorage. However, on March 7th, they got an unexpected call. The debit card had been used to withdraw $400 in Wilcox, Arizona. The kidnapper had left the state. An hour later, there was another withdrawal on the debit card, this time in Lordsburg, New Mexico. Again, he attempted to withdraw more than the daily limit. Then at the same ATM, the suspect used the debit card again, this time to check the balance in the account, $3,598.91. He withdrew another $80 to get as close as he could to the daily $500 limit. The kidnapper had used a smaller bank chain, one that didn't use a sophisticated surveillance system. It took the FBI two days to get images, which confirmed it was likely the same suspect that had made the withdrawals in Anchorage. A tall, Caucasian man wearing bulky, excessive layers in an attempt to hide his frame. He wore a hat, sunglasses, and a face mask with jeans and white tennis shoes. Officers were concerned that the suspect had left Alaska. It didn't bode well for Samantha. Officers were unsure if she was with him or if she was still in Alaska. Were there more than one kidnapper? Did they take her across the border? And why were they still risking capture by using her debit card? Local police, all FBI offices in the area, and Texas Rangers were all distributed a Be On The Lookout bolo flyer with Samantha's picture and the blurry image from the suspect from the ATMs, and the car that could be seen in the back of the ATM photos, likely a rental. The Texas Rangers are a state police agency famous for tracking down Bonnie and Clyde. They specialize in criminal and special investigations such as apprehending wanted felons, suppressing significant disturbances, and assisting smaller local law enforcement agencies. They didn't have a lot to go on. They were looking for a white male driving a white rental car from Alaska and in possession of a debit card for a missing girl. He seemed to be traveling eastbound on the I-10 highway. The card had been used most recently on March 12th in Shepard, Texas. It had been used at 2.47 a.m. and the FBI were able to determine, based on the shape of the windshield, that the suspect was driving an older model white Ford Focus. 
Bolo flyers were distributed to Texas Highway Patrol officers, and there was another ATM withdrawal in Humboldt, Texas. And on March 13th, Texas Ranger Stephen Rayburn was patrolling local hotel and motel parking lots when around 11 a.m. he spotted a white rental outside of a Quality Inn in Lufkin, Texas. They decided to send an officer to stake out the vehicle and get a look at the driver. By 11.30, the Ranger saw a tall white male begin to pack the Ford Focus and get into it. By now, the Anchorage PD and the FBI were all patched in and waiting on law enforcement in Texas to keep them updated. The suspect exceeded the local speed limit by 2 km per hour and allowed the officer to pull the driver over. The suspect calmly pulled over and stopped in a cafe parking lot. The officer asked for his license and registration and was shocked when he handed over an Alaskan driver's license. The name on the license was Israel Keys. Backup was called and the Texas Highway Patrol officer Brian Henry joined Rayburn. Keyes was in his mid-30s, he was wearing wraparound sunglasses and a white tank top with jeans. Without being asked, Keyes told Rayburn that he was in town for his sister's wedding and was sharing a room with his brother. Keyes asked why he was pulled over and was told that they were looking into a kidnapping that had occurred in Alaska. The officer ran his license number and noted his address was listed in Anchorage. He also stated that Keyes had no criminal record, no warrants, or even a speeding ticket. The officers indicated that Keyes was beginning to display nervous physical cues. He was also rambling and offering up information about his recent whereabouts, unsolicited. Keyes was asked when he arrived in Texas and how he got there. He said he came in on Thursday and said that he'd flown from Anchorage to Las Vegas and had driven from there to Texas. He mentioned his daughter, and officers asked where she was. They had noted clothing in the car that looked like it belonged to a little girl. He said that she was with his brother in Wells, Texas. Officers asked to search Keyes' wallet and car, and his demeanor changed to aggravated. From what officers could see from outside the car, there were white sneakers matching what the suspect had been wearing in the ATM surveillance, as well as several paper maps and rolls of cash in the passenger side door with red dye on it. Keyes was no longer cooperating with officers, and they had to make the decision to arrest him or let him go. Texas has looser probable cause laws. If an officer suspects that a vehicle has been used in connection with a crime, it's up to the officer's discretion to search it. However, they also had to take into consideration Alaskan law, as any trial would take place there, and they couldn't risk having potential key evidence being dismissed in an unlawful search. Officers in Alaska decided to allow the search. Israel Keyes was arrested, which gave Texas officers authority to search for what they wanted. They were looking for Samantha's debit card. And upon opening Keyes' wallet, they found the card with the pin etched into the plastic on the card. At this point, there were five officers on the scene and one was documenting the car's contents. They located several hoodies and jackets in the trunk, as well as a face mask similar to the one seen in the ATM image, gloves, a cell phone with the battery and SIMS card removed, a gun, and a black ski mask. They got him. He was arrested in Texas in March after withdrawing money from Koenig's bank account, ending his cross-country killing spree. Uh, we're jumping here, and the first thing I gotta tell you, uh, Israel, we talked about a little bit, uh, uh, earlier, that that stunt yesterday in the courtroom did not go over well. Um, What's that? Well, with a lot of folks, not the least of which were the uh, were the prosecutors. And that was the delay actually getting in here. Is we knew he had some legal questions, and so we reached out for him to say, "Hey, uh, Israel says he's got some questions. Are you guys available to speak to him?" And, uh, uh, I I couldn't even get one. One of them was in court, and the other one said, "You know, basically." what the fuck, <laughs> after yesterday. So uh, they, they didn't think that was too funny. Um, so and Why are they afraid I'd actually get away? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that would be embarrassing for them, I guess. <laughs> no, it's... Well, that is it for part one. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content and subscribe for more if you haven't already. If you've done all that and want to support me in the channel, we have channel membership as well as Patreon to get early access members only content and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box as well as links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.